Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the ice-glazed Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, February 10th, 2019. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert and welcome to our humble bunker, everybody. Hey, we have a live studio audience. (laughs) You mean other than Sam? Other than, well... Yeah, he he says, "Look, He's I'm a, a member of the team." Studio audience usually <laughs> live one, I know. But my best friend in the whole wide world, outside of my husband, is Cindy Martin, and she's moved in with us for a while until she gets her own spot down in uh, well, a little south of us. That's right. And so she's sitting in here with us. Welcome, Cindy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a little louder. <laughs> Yay! Hello! And we're getting Blue Lou next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're putting the band back together, the Elwood. Band, Elwood. Uh, well, welcome. Welcome. It's it's a lot of fun, uh, and, and we're having a lot of fun um, just talking, visiting, and, uh, and, and just marveling on the things that uh, God is doing. And, and you know, I, I marvel on the fact that I even talk this way. If somebody had said 30 years ago, Derek, someday you're going to be talking about the miracles that God is working in your life, and uh, that uh, it, it, because I was in a, in a much much different place then, I was pretty much in that same place, more or less, slightly moved when uh, when you and I met. But that's true. Uh, uh, it just the last twenty years has been a uh, remarkable journey, and uh, we're looking forward to an exciting year this year with w- this year with things happening that. Um, uh, again, if someone had said twenty years ago, you're going to be doing this, that, and the other, and you're going to be in front of hundreds and in some cases thousands of people preaching and pounding on a pulpit and you do <laughs> what if you're uh, almost as fun to watch as carl gallops you're getting there <laughs> well carl you know he's one of the best got to learn from him and tom horn and uh take away from that and uh you just apply apply that uh, uh to to uh, what uh, what i i've been led to over the last couple of years and uh who knows what'll come out it's uh <laughs> combination of college professor uh, and Pentecostal. <laughs> uh, Profocostal? Yeah, I think we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah, it's not time. good. Anyway, yeah, just some really exciting stuff um, uh, coming down the pike this year. And uh, w- one of which is is the research and the writing that we're going to be doing for our forthcoming uh, joint project. I know. It's a secret project. The title... Uh, we can can we give them? The I think title? we can share the title. Yeah, yeah, profiling the dead. Mm-hmm. And this is an outgrowth of the research that we've been doing for, um, well, last Clash of the Titans and for the Red Wing saga, mm-hmm. because we've learned as you read through the Old Testament carefully, especially, especially Isaiah and Ezekiel, but also um, some of the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, in, 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 and Joel, when you read carefully in Joel and then also during the Exodus, there, mm-hmm. there are clear references to a cult of the dead that was very prominent among the pagan neighbors of ancient Israel. And not only did that play, uh, the prophets clearly knew it, but they also understood that there was a prophetic role for those characters, <laughs> the, <laughs> the dead. And, you know, use the dead in air quotes because yes. dead just means dead in the physical form. We all yes. are going to live forever. At least until those who have rejected Jesus Christ are exactly. tossed into the lake well, of fire. Well, demons but, uh, are part of the dead. Exactly. Where did they come from? Okay. Think along those mm-hmm. lines and you're getting an idea of where we're going with our Zombie book. Acopoli- uh, apocalypse. apocalypse, yes. Something like that. That's the zombie acropolis. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but yeah, the, I do that same research for the Red Wing saga. In mm-hmm. fact, uh, book six, book five is Realms of Fire. Book six is Realms of the Dead. Yeah. Yeah. So this will apply to uh, Sharon's work, but uh, because the two of us have been digging into this so deeply that uh, we're going to uh, work on a book together. Nonfiction book. Nonfiction book for later this year that will deal with this in more detail. In fact, there's stuff I'm having to leave out of um, rabbit trails that I'm having to leave out of of Bad Moon Rising, which is the next book, about a third of the way through the editing. Um, First edit, then there'll be a professional editor who will take a look at it and clean up my, uh, you know, commas and stuff, but uh, stuff I'm having to leave out because it would just be a rabbit trail, but will fit perfectly in the forthcoming book. So anyway, just a lot of stuff that 25 years ago would have thought, oh, that's, that's crazy. Are, are you going to, you know, lose it? But when you start digging into the Bible, you realize that there's a lot more 
there there than we are taught in our churches. And yes. frankly, that's why we do the this this fellowship here. Amen to that. And I've been you that's why my head's been down. I've been looking opening up other tabs, had to open up the Septuagint tab oh, yes. for Esther, but also had to open up the tab in Blue Letter Bible for Deuteronomy nine. Oh yeah, yeah. We we got an email today and this was really uh this is encouraging because it says to us there are new folks, new people have come along who are, and I, you know, I've not gone back to double check this, but I'm sure this, this listener is right. Though. Oh, I think so too. And even if the listener was incorrect, which I'm sure the listener was right, uh, we don't want to take the chance that we really did miss this chapter because it's an important one and it, it has to do with the very thing we just talked about. That's a really good idea. May, you want to start there and do that first, then go back to yes. Esther? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. uh, we, we got an email from, and, and let me, let me bring this up here because I want or a comment rather at the website, gilberthouse.org, which is where you'll find all of the archives. Mm-hmm. And uh, give the person's first name. I, I will uh, as soon as I bring it up here. It, uh, and you can leave comments as well. And uh, by the way, we also notice that uh, a, lot, a lot of you are, are sharing these around on Facebook. Uh, we're seeing the uh, number of uh, shares on mm-hmm. Facebook, uh, and, and that is really humbling. We to see. really appreciate that because our, our our driving passion is this fellowship. Everything we do. This this fellowship is at the core of all of that. Yes, yes, and it has inspired us to write what we're writing. Mm-hmm. We started this about four years ago, four and a half four years and ago, half. and we're almost all the way through the Old Testament now. But uh, had we not started down this path, once we hit the Book of Exodus and realized, hey, wait a minute, God told the Israelites to turn around; they, they were getting away out mm-hmm. of Egypt. And has God, that always been in exactly? There? And so that started us digging into the old into the Bible. Mm-hmm. To see how the research of Dr. Michael Heiser, ding, 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 our weekly <laughs> that, Heiser reference. Yes, indeed. Um, and his unseen realm, the divine counsel concept, is um, the, the examples of, of where that appears in the Bible. And so that's led to... <laughs> it's all over the place. Three books on my part. And of course, it, inf- it, it basically informs the entire Red Wing side. It really does. Uh, it, because I had, And that's why we call this nonfiction book we're starting to work on, Profiling the Dead, because I've had to look at the unseen realm, both the, the loyal and the, the rebel angels, uh, what we would call angels, but these entities, the Elohim, and try to figure out what's in their heads. Mm-hmm. What motivates them to do what they do? Right. They clearly have free will mm-hmm. um, because they chose to use it to rebel against their creator. Mm-hmm. And um, this is not something that often is, is often explained in, in, in church. We, we get, have this, this kind of fuzzy idea about angels, which is why Mike Heiser wrote his recent book called Angels mm-hmm. on uh, God's Loyal Angels. We, we tend to focus on the, um, the, fallen, the ones. fallen ones because they're the enemy. But two-thirds of them are loyal. Exactly. Uh, but we just have this fuzzy idea about what they are. Get this idea of chubby little babies. You know, cherubs are cute little, you know, chubby-faced infants mm-hmm. with wings, when in fact, they're really bad dudes you don't want to mess with. You know, I just wrote a scene where um, Anatole explains that, not Anatole, but uh, Sarakiel explains about cherubs. In in particular, he's talking about Cupid. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he thinks it's really funny that Cupid is portrayed the way he is, when he sure. really is a bad dude. Exactly. Um the throne guardians of the ancient world were based mm-hmm. on the cherubim. And mm-hmm. those were the, like the winged bulls mm-hmm. outside the palace of the Assyrian king in Nineveh. That was based on what the... Uh, they will eat you for breakfast. Exactly. And that's probably what was... Uh, you know, we, we get this idea of the Ark of the Covenant with these w- this Western concept of angels with their wings touching in the middle of the Ark. Mm-hmm. No, these were bull... These were big, strong, bad mm-hmm. dudes who uh, were there to protect the Most High against any threat to the divine throne. Exactly. Which is why the kings of the ancient Near East adopted that imagery for mm-hmm. their own throne. Well, I'm just as important as... And the, the question is, was it always there? Or did, did those angels, were they the caravine put there because of the rebellion? Exactly. Yeah. That's that's the question. And that, yeah, that's and what that will be in Profiling the Dead. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Deuteronomy 9. Marilyn was the uh, one who pointed this out. And uh, Marilyn, thank you. Thank she you very much. She sent us a note saying, Deuteronomy 9 was never read. One day ended with chapter 8. The next day started with chapter 10. Kind of funny. Well, yeah, kind of funny. Kind of <laughs> embarrassing um, that we weren't even on top of what we were doing ourselves. But uh, we will rectify that. Now, because you're right, Deuteronomy mm-hmm. 9 is an important chapter, and we will get into this uh, right here. But first, a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing us together over your word this week. And and Lord, we we know we won't understand perfectly. There are things in your word that are not meant to be revealed until it's time. We're seeing as 
through a glass darkly. But we pray, Father, that um, you grant us wisdom to understand your word to the best of our ability. Help us, Lord, as we understand to add nothing to your word or take nothing away from it. And Lord, to um, as we go forth each each day to reflect the love that you showed us through your sacrifice. We pray, Father, for your blessing, and we ask for your wisdom as we uh, as we study this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, all right, um, Deuteronomy nine. This is um, Moses to set the scene, kind of uh, at the end of his life, and he's telling Israel, mm-hmm. "Okay, here's where you've been, and here's where you're going." And so, here's some final counsel from. Uh, the one who's led them for the past 40 years. Mm-hmm. So he's delivering this uh, on the plain, in the plains of Moab, right? I was going to say, uh, yes, and it says you are to cross over the Jordan today. Where did they cross over? Yeah. Uh, well, at uh, from the plains of Moab to the plains of Jericho. Right? Yes, of course, at Jericho. exactly. And you can see that from Mount Nebo, right? which is where we will be in May. Yeah. And there's a reason... Uh, and in fact, I was just editing this section of the uh, forthcoming book last night, why Jericho was chosen as the first target on the um, west of the Jordan River. It's not a coincidence that Jericho was named for the moon god. The Amorite name for the moon god is Yarik. And when you transliterate from Semitic into English, the Y becomes a J. So there was also a tribe. In fact, I didn't even realize this until I was writing the book. There was a town named Yariku in the Beka Valley which is north of Mount Hermon. There's the valley between the Lebanon mountains and the anti-Lebanon mountains. Mount Hermon is the southernmost uh-huh. end of the anti lebanons But at the north end of the Beka Valley is a town that scholars have only discovered in the last half century called Yariku, which was essentially Jericho. Mm-hmm. But it's also the name of an Amorite tribe that lived in that area, mm-hmm. named for the moon god. Yes. Now, the big center of moon god worship, other than Jericho, and other than the ancient city of Ur, which is in southeastern Iraq, is Haran, where... Abraham was called from. Coincidence? Mm, Mm, Well, read this because it's very interesting. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim. This is key because when you read in Joshua 11, the... Is it Joshua 11 or the end of Joshua 10? There's a, a chapter there, or a series of verses at the, I think it's the end of Joshua 11, where he kind of summarizes what the Israelites eventually do in Canaan. Mm-hmm. And it's all about, we dispossessed, we basically uh, um, wiped out the Anakim from the hill country of Judah, from the hill country of Israel. Only in Gath did some remain, because that's later where Goliath came from. Mr. Gilbert? Yes, Mrs. Gilbert. Well, I was just looking at the original language here, and the word translated cities is ir. Oh. Light bulb just went over your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have recognized that right away, because again, that's that's in the forthcoming book. Um, it doesn't mean that that's exactly what it means here, but in the context of people great and tall, yes. all of this that follows, it seems like a good candidate. Right. And what does fortified mean in the original Hebrew? Let me go look. Yeah. You explain anyway, what I'm going about and I'll look. The reason it. Sharon brought this up is because the word cities in um, Hebrew, ir, uh, and in plural it's irim, is the same word um, in Aramaic. Okay. There, there's an Aramaic word that's the same, but in Aramaic, that very same word ir means watcher, as in the watchers, as in the angels who descended on Mount Hermon and created the Nephilim by mating with human women. The original word here, batsar, mm-hmm. means to cut off. Interesting. It can also mean to fortify or to fence in or to restrain, but the, the root meaning is to cut off. Huh. If you change that to watchers cut off from heaven. Huh. Okay. Now, I don't know that that's correct or not, but I find it very... Well, we need to do more study on that. But yes, that, that's something that I explore a bit in the forthcoming book, The uh, uh, Bad Moon Rising, mm-hmm. because there are other places in the Bible. The only place that Watchers is mentioned in the Bible anywhere is in Daniel chapter 4 in the context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Mm-hmm. Watchers, the holy ones, yes. or a watcher, a holy one, 
which, by the way, that parallel term, holy ones, is used elsewhere in the Bible. So we need to look into that, too, because it's usually translated as saints. But the root behind mm-hmm. it, Kadesh, um, in Daniel 4, is used in parallel with Irim, the watchers. And may refer to the name of Kadesh Barnea. Yes, right. Exactly. Same root. So, uh, But there are places in Isaiah, Isaiah 33 and Isaiah 14, where uh, the word cities in that in those contexts actually makes more sense to translate as watchers rather than as cities. Well, in this context it context it may mean. It may mean watchers. That's right because you're dealing with it in the same context as the sons of the Anakim. Mhm. Goliath So is, read 1 and 2 again. Yeah, because later it, when when David confronts Goliath he's called one of the sons of Rapha, one of the sons of the Rephaim. Now, does that mean they were literally giants? No, not necessarily, but what it means is that they were devotees or worshipers of these Rephaim mm-hmm. spirits yes. who were the spirits of the Nephilim. They worship demons, yes. which is something Paul describes. A- Amen. And if you translate that uh, ear as, as watchers, yes. watchers great and fortified up to heaven, that's still, it's this idea of uh, preparing for battle. Yes, yes. They knew Yahweh was bringing the uh, Hebrew people back. Right. And territorial spirits are attested in the Bible. The prince of Persia, but also, as we talked about when we got to that section in Daniel, um, the angel who came to deliver the message to Daniel was left with not just the prince of Persia, but the kings of Persia, which in that context could only have been supernatural beings. Yes. So here you're, okay, wow. Write it down. Yeah. Thank you, Marilyn. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you're right, because this is cool stuff. Here, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations greater, greater and mightier, greater too, and mightier than you, watchers, great and fortified up to heaven. That gives or, it a whole different it meaning, does. doesn't it? The, the, watchers prepared for battle. Exactly. The context of the word cities is that it's an area that had to be defended by a watch or mm-hmm. watchers or watchmen. Mm-hmm. So that's the why those words are the same. Cities great and fortified, or watchers great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakim, who were, of course, the sons of the watchers, Mm -hmm. whom you know, and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Know therefore today, and interestingly, this is another, these people, the Anakim, were attested outside the Bible, one of the Egyptian execration texts which is sort of their version of uh, voodoo dolls. Yeah. yeah. They, they write the name of their enemies on pottery and then smash it after they pronounce curses. But the Anakim are, were, have been found among the execration texts. Know therefore today that he who goes over before you as a consuming fire is Yahweh your God. In other words, God is going into battle against these supernatural entities mm-hmm. who are arrayed against you. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. So you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly as Yahweh has promised you. (laughs) This this chapter is so much cooler. Did you write it down to make sure you go back to nine? I don't think I'm going to need to write this one down. Okay, well, just remember it. Marilyn, if he doesn't do it, write him another note. Exactly. Uh, Do not say in your heart after Yahweh your God has thrust them out before you. It is because of my righteousness that Yahweh has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, Yahweh your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word that Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Yes, Mrs. Gilbert. (laughs) Let's go back to where you refer to thrusting out before you. Okay. Okay. That word is yerash, and it refers to this idea of dispossession or disinheritance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mike Heiser's written about that. There's a, mm-hmm. there, because there are differences um, between dispossessing and, oh boy, dispossessing and um, what's the other, the other term? Uh, harem, you know, de- devoting to destruction. Yes. Some of the, the people in the land were, it was okay for mm-hmm. the Israelites to, to make treaties with them and dispossess them, but others, God said, these people are just totally sold out. They are haram. They are Well, this one is not haram. This yeah. one is yerash. And I think this idea of dispossessing, 
disinheriting mm -hmm. is a big one because... Oh, right. Yes. Well, d uh, ding, ding, ding. It connects, yeah. Because all of this is about restoring humanity to the yes. divine council. Yes, exactly. Another right. Heiser reference. Ding. Exactly. Yeah, our, our purpose, God's purpose in all of this is bring, to bring humanity back to Eden, back mm -hmm. to the garden from which we were ejected in the days of Adam and Eve. And this is battle number one. Mm. So, yes, uh, because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you and, and disinheriting, okay? Mm -hmm. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart. Okay, we did all that. We'll skip down to verse 6 now and pick it up. Know, therefore, that Yahweh your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked Yahweh your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. Even at Horeb you pronounced or you provoked Yahweh to wrath, and Yahweh was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. This is Moses speaking again. When I went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that Yahweh made with you, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. And Yahweh gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that Yahweh had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. The mount of the assembly, mm -hmm. the mount of the congregation. That's exactly where he was. Yep. And at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, Yahweh gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then Yahweh said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made themselves a metal image. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the calf, yes. symbol of the moon god. Right. Which is very important to reference back to the whole fact that they're going into the city of the moon god. Exactly. Um, the golden calf was, um, the frisky calf of heaven mm -hmm. was one of the epithets of um, the moon Damn. god, uh, the, of the moon god. Uh, uh, scene, oh, that's right. Scene. That's right. Yeah. Scene. Which, which, again, if you are going to go to Jordan with us, you're going to hear us talk about this in a way you've never heard before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, some good stuff coming. Furthermore, Yahweh said to me, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stubborn people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mountain and the mountain was burning with fire. And the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked and behold, you had sinned against Yahweh, your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that Yahweh had commanded you. So I took hold of the two tablets and, th and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. Then I lay prostrate before Yahweh as before, 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. This Be poor guy went 80 days. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Clearly some supernatural divine intervention there oh, to keep yeah. him alive during that period. Yes. Yeah. Because of all the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of Yahweh to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that Yahweh bore against you, so that he was ready to destroy you. But Yahweh listened to me that time also. And Yahweh was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him. And I prayed for Aaron also at that same time. Then I took the sinful thing, the calf that you had made, and burned it with fire and crushed it, grinding it very small until it was as fine as dust. Then I threw the dust of it into the brook that ran down from the mountains, uh, ran down from the mountain. Interestingly, this is, um, this type of thing is attested in, um, other battles between pagan nations in the ancient Near East. When one conquering nation would defeat another, they would go in there and they would destroy the idols of their gods so that the gods would not have a place, a, a locality to come to right. and intervene on behalf of the defeated enemy. So this was, uh, Again, just more mm -hmm. evidence that, uh, that the context from which this the Bible emerged is is accurate. It wasn't made up after the fact. Um, let's see. Uh, at at, at Teb Tabera also, and at Massah and Kibroth Hataava, you provoked Yahweh to wrath. And when Yahweh sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and take possession of the land that I have given you, 
Then you rebelled against the commandment of Yahweh your God and did not believe him or obey his voice. You have been rebellious against Yahweh from the day that I knew you. So I lay prostrate before Yahweh these forty days and forty nights, because Yahweh had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to Yahweh, O Lord Yahweh, do not destroy your people and your heritage, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us say, because Yahweh was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. And by his heritage, the whole point of this again, if you read Deuteronomy um, 32, verses 8 and Mm 9, you you understand that when God divided the nations after Babel, he allotted to the nations the host of heaven, sun, moon, the stars of heaven, as gods for those nations. Mm -hmm. But he reserved Jacob, Jacob, Israel, was his allotted heritage. That was the uh, deal. And that's why the Old Testament is essentially the rest of the world against Israel. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's kind of why that's the way things are today. The rest of the world against Israel. Has Israel. it changed at all, has right. it? Well, I'm so glad again, Marilyn, that you let us know that because there's a lot of there there. Yeah. And the cool thing about that is that even back then, I'm not sure that we would have caught everything that was in there. And I'm sure that we haven't caught everything that's in there yet. I was just going to say that same thing. You're right. You're right. Because four years ago, we've learned a lot in the last four mm-hmm. years. So when we go back through the uh, Bible again, which we'll do after we complete this cycle, um, we'll, uh, I'm sure, have more to say and different things to say about mm-hmm. the uh, scriptures that we read. So, And now, when we, when we left <laughs> Esther... <laughs> when we last left Mordecai... <laughs> <laughs> Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Remember that letters had gone out to all the, the various leaders of the many parishes and provinces, with uh, provinces, mm. not parishes, but provinces within the kingdom, massive kingdom. Mm-hmm. And uh, lo- yeah. what was it, 122 or something like that? Something or? like that. Uh, it was the the kingdom of Persia at this point stretched from, uh, it included all of what is now today Turkey, plus Armenia and Azerbaijan and Georgia and uh, Syria, Israel, you know, Egypt, everything as far as from India to Turkey, Mm -hmm. basically. It was huge. Yeah, it was a big, big area. So all of that area had been told through this letter, starting in December. Mm -hmm. You go out and get them because these these guys, this this bunch of Jews, they no longer, they don't want to play ball. Yeah. They're a threat to our nation. As if they didn't have enough to worry about with the Greeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so again, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Hmm. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. <laughs> she, she she misidentified the problem here. Yeah. You could come in if you just put on this nice suit. It says right here on the on the on the gate. Mm-hmm. No shirt, no shoes, no service. <laughs> <laughs> then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Ethak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had paid, had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Hmm. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor. 
and plead with him on behalf of her people. Mm. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king for these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to re- to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this, much like Joseph. Yeah. And interestingly, this, in a sense, kind of relates to what we just read in Deuteronomy 9. It's like, look, don't think that because you're so special that God is doing this and bringing you into this special place. Mm -hmm. God, when you think about his long game, his long plan to bring forth the Messiah for our salvation, didn't bring the Jews, obviously, into Israel because they were righteous. Because as Moses said, look, you've been stubborn since the day we left Egypt. But God brought them into that land as part of his long plan to bring Mm -hmm. forth the Messiah, a deliverer for all of the people who would turn to him and accept him as Lord. Exactly. He didn't disinherit the watchers with plans to put us in their place because we are so great. Right. He did it because that's simply his nature, and he provided entrance into the divine council for us through his blood. Right. Yeah, interesting how this uh, sort of fits together. Mm -hmm. Almost like, as Chuck Missler called it, an integrated message system from beyond our our time domain. (laughs) Oh, Chuck, how we miss him. Verse 15, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Hmm. Esther chapter 5. On the third day. Third hmm. day, we see. I know she was fasting. We've seen that time frame over and over again. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you, even to the half of my kingdom. That is a God thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And Esther said, if it please the king. This is a phrase that uh, Haman used, by the way, last uh, in in last week's study. If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, and all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he advanced, how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. 
Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows... Oh, interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. What is the word in Hebrew there, gallows? Well, web is slow. Yeah, no, mine is too. Let a gallows 50 cubits high be made. That's a tall gallows. Very tall. Much taller than you need. 75 feet high. Think about that. That's a seven-story gallows. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Mm -hmm. We want everyone to see. To see him hang, exactly. Exactly. Let a gallows 50 cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Mm. Do you have time for six? We do. We're only at uh, th- about 37 minutes. What? <laughs> We didn't blather nearly enough. What's wrong with us? (laughs) Chapter 6. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Do you think they included the part about how the Spartans beat him at Thermopylae, or at least delayed them long enough so the Athenians could... Yeah, because the Spartans eventually got wiped out, but uh, it... Gave the Athenians time to get, and the rest of the Greeks mm-hmm. to get their defenses together. So, yeah, uh, that's why we in the West don't speak Farsi today. <laughs> anyway. Well, and then it I was found. Class. Yes, indeed, because this is local lore. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said... What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows. Let's see here if it gives me the alternative. (laughs) Or suspended on a stake. Uh. That's different. That's almost like crucifixion, which the Persians did invent, by the way. Yes. Or like being put on a pike. Yeah. The way uh, Vlad, Vlad Tepes did. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, for again, and the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows or hung upon a stake yeah. that he had prepared for him. And the king's young man told him, Haman is there standing in the court, and the king said, well, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? (laughs) Yeah, and by by the way, you are correct. Uh, We missed this in in Esther chapter 2, but the Hebrew indicates that the men were not hanged, they were impaled. Yes, it's like Vlad Vlad Tepish did. Yeah, this was a common practice in the ancient Near East. It was not necessarily how criminals were killed. They would often be killed beforehand, but... uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still gruesome. It's like somebody came along and said, that's too gruesome. Let's just change that and make it hanging. Yeah, yeah. No, they were Yeah, they, would, they were basically going to impale Mordecai mm-hmm. in a huge, huge spike. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, hmm, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set, or a headdress is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew. Ha! who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. (laughs) So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. 
than Mordecai returned. The Lord is so wonderful. He's got such a sense of humor. He really does. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife, Zeresh, boy, she's a piece of work, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, if Mordecai, before, you, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. <laughs> They've begun to realize, mm. oops. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. So he's... Uh, Probably holding out hope. It's like, okay, maybe I can still solve this. Maybe I can mm-hmm. still salvage this. This is We're, we're not dead yet. Mm-hmm. Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman went into feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, this is a long, long feast. feast. As they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, And if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish, and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? And who has dared... To do this. Can you just imagine the color draining from Haman's mm-hmm, face mm-hmm. at this point? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows, or the pike, Pike. gulp, that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house fifty cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged him on on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Woo. How are we doing on time? About 45 minutes. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. Hmm. Having that signet ring essentially makes you the ruler. Sort of like Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now, again, this is another historic element that is um, accurate Mm -hmm. in the telling of this story. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, this was a custom among Persian kings. An enemy was destroyed, the king would confiscate the estate of the destroyed enemy. Mm -hmm. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king, and she said, If it please the king... And if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to King Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the pike, the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it 
with the king's ring, for an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The king's scribes were summoned. Now, here's here's what I read into that verse. In other words, um, Haman had previously used the ring to send out the letters. Right. So it can't be revoked, the fact that these people for one day in December will be fair game. Mm-hmm. So this is how the king you know, fixes that. The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Shivan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written, according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, mm. to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then they sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses because some time has gone past. Yeah. And that. Yeah. In fact, the uh, the dating of this, the 23rd, uh, 23rd day of the month of Sivan, uh, when you add that up, c- compare it against when the e- edict was issued. 70 days from the date of the original edict. Oh, is that? Oh. 70. You've got to write that down. That's interesting. Yep. That is interesting. There's a lot of stuff in here. In fact, I plan on digging into this Esther chapter. And, and, and Bur- it's just the whole book is, to, yeah, I've really got to unpack this. Just got to find some time to do it. Yeah. It's it's a little, there's a little more depth here than just, oh, uh, oh yeah, this is a feminist uh a feminine. This is you know, no, a, it's a, a not. testimony, a testament to feminism. That's it's, a it's, twisting of what's in here. Exactly. But yeah. there's a lot of real stuff in here that I think is worth a great deal to the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script, to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed it with a king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, (laughs) saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them children and women included, and to plunder their goods. Mm -hmm. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Yeah. So this is, uh, and it's good that we're reading this like this, because when I've read this story before, I had always sort of taken away from my mind that Ahasuerus had revoked. No. No. The decree, but he couldn't do it. But mm-hmm. what he said is, okay, on this one day that I decreed that these other people could come and attack you, on that one day you can arm yourselves and defend yourselves. Mm-hmm. So that was the only way he could get around not revoking a royal decree because the king is never wrong. No royal decree, maybe. Well, Which, once you course, start that down that road, then. Right. Yeah. Verse 13, a copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province being publicly displayed to all peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers, mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, and with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple and the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor mm. this is an already but not yet yes oh the day yeah is coming when all the Jews will have this right and all the church mm-hmm. we will we will be wearing fine robes and we will have crowns and we will be honored yeah the that day's al- coming. The, the ultimate fulfillment of what Paul called one new man, mm-hmm. where there was neither Jew nor Gentile. Exactly. But all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Yeah. Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, and in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, 
There was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday, and many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. <laughs> Don't hurt me, I'm one of you. Yeah, the king has taken favor on them, uh, and besides, it seems like their God is pretty powerful, so maybe mm-hmm. we should. Uh, Esther chapter 9. Now in the twelfth month, which is in the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. That's supernatural. Mm Mm-hmm. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. Okay, let's stop for a second. Think about spiritually what's going on behind the scenes, behind the people. Spiritually, the enemy, the fallen realm, were trying to take out the Jews in the entire world. Right. I mean, a hundred years before this, the time of Daniel... The prince of Persia, the supernatural power behind Persia, which took over Babylon, uh, you know, where Daniel was being kept, tried to prevent that message from getting to Daniel by holding up the angel. And it took mm-hmm. the archangel Michael intervening, his intervention to mm-hmm. allow that angel to get free and, and bring his prophecy to Daniel, what would happen at the end. But then God, behind the scenes, was using the, the Medes and the Persians, the, the empire created by Cyrus and King Xerxes here, Ahasuerus, to save the Jewish people from the enemy that wanted to destroy them. How interesting. God said, no, no, (laughs) you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. You're a dog on a chain and you've reached the end of your chain. So, yeah, interesting how uh, there's more going on here in the spirit realm than we're ever taught. I I think a a lot of... uh, Clearly, Mordecai and Esther were people of faith. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And... But as Mordecai himself pointed out, look, if you don't do this, we'll be saved some other way, but Mm -hmm. you'll be destroyed. Yes. Yes, exactly. He had faith that the Lord had a plan. Right. And he believed Esther was part of that plan, but if she refused to do it, fine, he'll choose somebody else. Exactly. Too many modern interpretations of the Bible, not just this story, but modern interpretation of Bible stories, try to put the, the emphasis on what the human did. And yes, we are called upon to respond to God's love and God's sacrifice. But at the end of the day, he doesn't need us to wield his sword. His plans will be fulfilled regardless of what we choose to do. He knew from the beginning of time what we would choose to do. I mean, this is the mystery of it. I mean, the, the whole argument between election and predestina- you know, predestination and free will. Mm-hmm. But God knows because he's outside of time. He perceives things going on around us in ways that we just can't. We're locked into linear time. Mm-hmm. And we were created with free will, just as these fallen angels were created with free will. But at the end of the day, it's about him and what he's already done for us. We're called to respond to his love, called to respond to his will. But we don't get the credit. Hmm. We don't get the credit for accomplishing the miracles that we read in, in Scripture. Nor should we read ourselves into each story. And use them as object lessons. Like, yes, if we pray this prayer that so-and-so prayed, then God will be obligated to respond the way he did back then. This is th- That's reducing God to a formula, to, to a magic yes. incantation. Yes, exactly. Now, the Lord has, he has wonderful plans for your life, but you have to be willing to go through the doors he opens. Yes. You can't just say, I want this, therefore I'm going to force you to open this door. Yeah. It, it, that's not how it works. And really, when you come down to it, you think about it, it, that's the tragedy of those who have fallen into, who, who've fallen under the power of these, these false gods, these small G gods. I mean, there are other gods, small G gods, created beings, fallen angels, if you want to think of them that way. But the Bible calls them gods. God in the Bible calls mm-hmm. them gods. But the tragedy is uh, the human dupes who've fallen under their power, who've who've accepted their lies, believe their lies, is that they're not going to stop what God has already decided is going to happen. They're not going to change the outcome. What will be, will be. God has already ordained and he's already told us in broad terms, here's what's happening. Guess what? I win. The only thing that those people are doing by resisting his 
call, resisting his will, is bringing on their own destruction. Mm -hmm. Just as Haman did here. I mean, Esther, yes, she's to be honored because she was faithful and was willing to put herself at risk by risking death. And so, yes, honor her for that. But don't give her the credit for swaying the king. Because as Mordecai said, God's going to save us one way or another. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you know God didn't put you there for this purpose? And to Esther's credit, she said, okay, all right. And if God destroys me, that's fine, but so be it. And um, I, I think that's that's a takeaway from this story that uh, I don't often hear. I, in our modern worldview, we like to put the credit, hey, you know, Abraham, okay, yeah, he was faithful. And so credit to Abraham for doing these things. And because of Abraham, we dot, dot, dot. Well, well no, if Abraham had been resistant to God's will, God would have chosen someone else. Exactly. But it was important that he was faithful. Oh, it, it's oh, just no that, question. you know, we shouldn't, you know, raise him up as I keep hearing some sort of a static. I'll fix it later. I don't know if it's my hear I think it's in my headphones. Must be, because I'm not hearing it. Yeah. I get it every once in a while like there's it's a dirty connection or something. <laughs> Either that or, or my ears, ears. Are just going. <laughs> <laughs> it could be my ears going. Uh but anyway I just wanted to really quickly, so. you know, mention that because this this book is all about the spiritual battle that's taking place. Yes. And we often forget that uh, and try to make it about, um, you know, empowering women or, or, you know, the greatness of Esther or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and again, that's not to, you know, belittle what she did or or downplay what she did. Just as, you know, we don't downplay the faithfulness of uh, Mary Mm -hmm. in in the role of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We don't lift her up and elevate her to the status of mother of God. No, or queen of heaven. Or queen of heaven, you know, God forbid. But at the end of the day... As Mordecai said, you know, if you don't do this, God will do it some other way and you will be destroyed. And to me, that, that, that resonates for some reason, um, because that's the tragedy of the billions of pagans in this world. Sadly, the billions of Muslims in this world, they're not going to prevent the return of Messiah and his ultimate victory. They will not have glorious, victorious global jihad, um, Sadly, all they're doing by following that path is is bringing on their own destruction. So, so true. Anyway, I think we'll be able to finish the whole book here. Because okay. uh, chapter well. 10 is very, very short, but let me uh, dive back in here. Um, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. Verse 2. This is Esther chapter 9. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. <laughs> for Mordecai was, was great in the king's house. And his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshandatha, and Delphon, and Aspatha, and Paratha, and Adaliah, and Eridatha, and Parmashta, and Erasai, and Eridai, and Vyazatha the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. That is really supernatural, the fact that he's seen some of his own citizen killed. Right. But uh, apparently glad because, look, I had been deceived into decreeing the Mm -hmm. death of all your people, and instead they have won victory. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows on the pike. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed seventy-five thousand of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day, They rested and made that day a day of feasting and gladness. 
But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th, and rested on the 15th day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make of them da- make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, again Amalekite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast pure, that is, lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they called these days Purim, after the term pure. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter, and of all that they had faced in this matter, and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them, that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written, and at, a, and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai the Jew, gave full written authority confirming this second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, in, the word, in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fasts and their lamenting. The command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. Chapter 10, Three Whole Verses King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea, and all, on all the acts of his and all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of his high of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? Again, this is historic. Mm-hmm. This book is not a parable. Mm-hmm. For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. This is interesting, and again, perhaps another example of the sense of humor of God. One of the things I read is that there's some, uh, in researching the book Bad Moon Rising, in kind of examining whether the fallen realm feuded and fought with one another, which I think is historical. I mean, we see the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece in the book of Daniel prophesied, you know, about their future fight. But you see that um, the pagan nations in the ancient world fought with one another as much as they fought with Israel. I mean, Mm -hmm. you think if they were all united against God and wanting to eliminate the bloodline that would produce the Messiah, why didn't they collaborate first, eliminate Israel, and then fight for control of the earth amongst themselves. Well, exactly. Think back to the the Tower of Babel, where the Lord said they are all of one mind and one language. There is nothing that is impossible to them. Now, picture the fallen realm, who are much more powerful than we are, if they just have one common goal Mm -hmm. and agree to do that. Yeah. So they they can't do it. They can't. There's enough hubris there that they would reject the authority of the one who created them. And I would say that it's so possible. So why wouldn't they fight with each other? Oh, exactly. And it's possible, too, that the way I picture it in the Red Wing Saga, that there are uh, fomenters within them, mm-hmm. you know, agents provocateur, who are loyal angels who are pretending to be fallen. Well, one of my theories is this, that um, the moon god was the, uh, the personal god of the dynasty, the Amorite dynasty that founded Babylon. And Babylon, of course, set up an occult system so wicked that it became the symbol of the end times church of the Antichrist. So it's a symbol of wickedness all through the Bible, founded by the Amorites who were loyal to the moon god, named Sin, mm-hmm. spelled ironically Sin. 
Marduk, though, was the city god of Babylon, who was elevated to the top of the Babylonian pantheon. Mm -hmm. But the kings of Babylon, the first kings, didn't swear their oaths by Marduk. They swore them by Sin, their year names, which is how they tracked the calendar back in the day. In the 12th year of the reign of King Hammurabi, the year names were named for Sin, not Marduk. So Marduk was sort of a figurehead. He was sort of like, you know, okay, here, you, you go out there and, you know, as the mayor or whatever, mm-hmm. and we'll just do stuff in the background. There are scholars who believe that the chief deity of the Persians, of the Zoroastrian, you know, Ahura Mazda, was just another name for Marduk. Oh, that's interesting. So what if, what if Marduk decided he was tired of being used as a puppet Moved over to Persia. Because here's the thing. The last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, Mm -hmm. was a worshiper of the moon god. His Mm -hmm. mother was a priestess at the temple of the moon god in Haran, which Nabonidus found and rebuilt. The temple had been built 1,500 years earlier by the Akkadian king, Mm -hmm. Naram-Sin. And Nabonidus wanted to make Sin the top god in the Babylonian pantheon, replace Marduk. But on that last night, when they were having this big festival, the Akitu festival for the moon god, that was when the handwriting was on the wall. Mm -hmm. Many, many take a parson. Mm -hmm. Um, And the Persians came into the city. There are some scholars who think that the Marduk priesthood, upset with Nabonidus and his son Belshazzar, opened the gates and let the Persians in. Oh, how interesting. Because they didn't want to be replaced. So what if this is just a big supernatural fight and God behind it, Yahweh behind it, kind of manipulating all of this and then using the Persians to save the Jews with a Jew named Mordecai, whose name was based on the name Marduk. Oh, good, 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 good. We take it as a given. The Lord works all things together for good. That's even the plans of the fallen. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Again, they're not going to stop it. They're only bringing on their own Mm -hmm. destruction. Yeah. Well, fascinating stuff. Well, what do we get into next week? We're getting close to the... Oh, good question. Next week, uh, we move into a new book. Well, we go back to Ezra, actually. Ah. Because Ezra began with the rebuilding of the temple, but then we come back to uh, Ezra and Nehemiah leading another group of Jews from Mesopotamia back to Jerusalem. So we'll pick up uh, the book of Ezra next week, Ezra chapter 7. Exciting stuff. Yeah. Oh, this is cool, cool stuff. Whew. Yeah. Well, close with a word of prayer here. Oh, but oh well, really yeah, quickly, talk, yeah. I want to just make sure everybody knows that Mondo de la Vega is going to be on with you tonight on VFTB Live. Oh, right, right, right. That is the uh, live webcast I do every week. If you miss it, you can catch it in the archives. But if you listen tonight, uh, 7 p.m. Central Time, that is UTC minus 6, at vftb.net. There's a player there, and when it goes live, you can just listen live right there at Mm vftb.net. That's the easiest way to do it. There's an app that you can download, free app. Right. But yeah, just like there's a free Gilbert House app. Mm -hmm. You can download that. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Follow the links to the App Store and to uh, Google Play at gilberthouse.org, but you can also get the View from the Bunker app at vftb.net. So Mondo De La Vega will talk about his journey from the streets of Los Angeles to television ministry. It is so inspirational. His story just makes you cry. And his work as a bodyguard for professional wrestlers. Yes. Well, I know. (laughs) (laughs) Joe Horn so wants to have that job. How he led Rowdy Roddy Piper to the Lord. Yes. Yes. You're going to hear that story. Seriously. Yeah. We're definitely going to talk about that tonight. That's after 7 p.m. Central Time at VFTB.net. Father, we thank you for this day and for bringing us through this uh, exciting study. Um, Thank you, Lord, for bringing to mind through listener Marilyn the... uh, the chapter that we'd missed in the book of Deuteronomy, which is so important. Lord, we are grateful that you open our eyes to the deeper meaning in Scripture, adding nothing to your word, but just understanding through the worldview, the eyes of the prophets and the apostles, what they understood and how important that conflict is in the spirit realm to what we see in the natural realm. Lord, it's But we know it's one thing to read about it and to study it. And when we're seeing it and experiencing it in our own lives, it's easy to be blinded by our natural senses. So Lord, help us when confronting difficulties in the natural realm to understand that there may be spirits behind this that are trying to confuse us, demoralize us, distract us. And to turn to you, Father, for help. We pray, Father, for your blessing 
for wisdom and discernment. We ask for your blessing and protection for those who are taking the gospel to the ends of the world, bringing your light to the nations. We pray, Father, for your guidance as we seek to serve you and point others to and to lift up Christ and him crucified in all that we do. Father, we pray for those who are suffering financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually this weekend, Lord, that your uh, spirit would give them comfort and strength, knowing, Father, that the end will be joyful, and that as Paul wrote, the glory that is to come will make the trials that we suffer today as nothing. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. Thank you.